Jim Richards want to welcome you to this Cyberchurch broadcast where we want to connect you with all the things that Jesus did for you through his death, burial, and resurrection. Remember, Jesus said, I've come that might have life and have it to its fullest, have it to the very best degree that you can have it. So, you know, everything I share with you is based on the new covenant. And in the new covenant, we are delivered from the curses of the law. We are qualified for, for all of the inheritance of the kingdom and all the promises of God are yes, because we're not just, not just because we're in Jesus, but because our faith is in the fact that we are in Jesus. Our faith is in the resurrected Lord. Our faith is in the fact that he received this inheritance and we're just, we're just participating in what he has done for us. Man, a lot. I think the gospel gets so incredibly simple when you suck all the religion out of it and just go, oh, let's, let's just go back to what Jesus taught. Let's go back to what Jesus showed us. Let's go back to what Jesus accomplished his death, burial, and resurrection because, oh, wait a minute. That's the basis of the new covenant. Well, you know, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, miraculous probabilities. And in this series, you know, we're talking about being able to move from, from God's promises being possible to being probable to be to, to being ab to absolute assurance. Man, what a journey. And, and I'm telling you, you can make that journey. You know, one of the books I read when I first got saved, and it was really interesting because I, I can't even believe this book was put out by Jerry Falwell's organization, but it was a book written by Watchman Nee called The Normal Christian Life. Now, let me just say this. Most of the books that are out with Watchman's knee, Watchman Nee's name on them, he didn't actually write. His followers wrote them after he died using information from sermons he preached, but, but kind of put their own slant on it. But the normal Christian life, the thesis of this book, the whole concept of, of, of this book was this. What, what is the normal Christian life? And, and he presented this idea, this realization that what we consider to be like really spiritual, really powerful, really above average uh, 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 Christian living was really what Jesus described to be, this should be the norm for every believer. We are living in a subnormal Christian life. Most of us are. And we're looking at the people that life is working for them in Christ. And, and man, they're enjoying life. And you, know, you ever spot those people where it just seems like, yeah, I'm, yeah, they have challenges. You know, they got issues. They got all the same things happen around them that you have happen around you. But it's sort of like, how is it they always sail through this? How is it they always have a great attitude? How is it they always come out? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, that's really how it's supposed to be. It's called overcomers. It's called people who overcome because they know who they are in Jesus. They trust in the finished work of Jesus. Uh, um, and they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, the love not their life to the death. And, I, you know, we could spend a whole lot of time on that. But, but uh, uh, the, the whole idea in, in Watchman Nee's book is that, is that uh, we look at things that are just promised to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We say, oh, man, that's, that's, you know, that's big. That's, you know, that, this, is, this is, you know, trying to believe for this is just way, way, way beyond, you know, uh, uh, what I should be able to believe for. You know, as a new believer, I'll never forget coming to this realization that, that uh, if you have enough faith to get born again, you actually have enough faith for everything else that's included in the inheritance in the new covenant. But somehow we have twisted this thing around and we have made it where getting born again is just, is just kind of minute. This is a small miracle, but like getting healed is a big miracle. Our, our sovereign financial problems, that's a, that's a big, that's a, that's a whole different thing. Let me tell you something. It's a, the greatest miracle that you will ever experience. It doesn't matter if you get healed from cancer. It doesn't matter if you grow a hand back that's been cut off. That's not as great of the miracle as getting born again because getting born again is a resurrection from the dead. It is you uh, becoming a new person through joining in with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, man, you know, if you can believe for that, you can believe for anything. But the problem is, 
we put limits on God. And you know, uh, you know, I just, just finished a series, I think our last series was talking about that, about taking the limits off God. Man, we put these limits on God. We limit what God can do in our lives because you know, we look at something and in our mind it looks big. We look, we, we look at the need that's in our life and we exalt that need to be bigger, more powerful than the resurrection of Jesus. And when we do that, then we have limited God and, and we said, you know, our, this situation is unique. My situation is different. Th you know, this, this wasn't covered through the resurrection. Well, I got news for you. Everything was covered through the resurrection. And I want to do everything I can to help you live this quality of life. But let me say something. It doesn't end there. I, I, I don't want you to think that this, I'm, I'm like a name it and claim it and grab it and stab it kind of guy. You know, uh, God wants you to have an incredible life because if you have an incredible life, then you influence the people around you and they see that your walk with God uh, is something to be desired and it makes the gospel look appealing. It makes the gospel look desirable and, and that draws people to God. And so, so then you fulfill God's commission to make disciples because people are coming to you and say, man, how, how do you get this to work? How does your life work this way? You know, help, help, me, help me, help me have what you have. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Nothing will make you feel quite as good. I'm not talking about a self-righteous thrill up your leg. I'm talking about, I'm just talking about just feel good about, uh, about your walk with God. When people c tell you, I, you know what? I, I want what you got. And I'll tell you, when people want what you got, then you know that, uh, what God is doing in your life is fulfilling His ultimate purpose. His ultimate purpose isn't just so that you have a good life, even though it's part of it, because you have a good life, you fall in love with God, you trust God, all these things happen. But everything that God does in us, it, is only, it only reaches fulfillment, it only reaches completion, it only fulfills the goal if it becomes an expression of love to other people so that we draw them to the Lord. We have, we have an influence on them. So I want you to live a great life, and I want people around you to go, man, alive, I, wanna, I want to live this life. And so that's why in our ministry, we make disciples. Not disciples to our ministry, not disciples to Jim Richards, disciples unto Jesus. We show people how to connect to Jesus as Lord, how to wrap their lives around the death, burial, and resurrection, how to enjoy resurrection life in this world. And you know what? And we take that all over the world. We are touching people all over. Let me, let me just mention this to you. You know, many of you contact me sometimes and you know, I'll go on here for weeks at a time, never mention anything about finances. Don't try to take up offerings and all that kind of stuff. But from time to time, I, I, I want to mention this. We have what we call world changers and world changers are people who have their life so dramatically influenced by this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they're like, I want everybody in the world to hear this. And so, you know, you can go to drjimrichards.com, you go to impactministries.com, and you can become a world changer, and you can, you can become a part of financially helping us to raise up a billion disciples around the world. And that's what we're doing, that's, that's what all of our efforts are into, and man, we are, we're, we're going to do this till my last breath, and, and when I leave planet Earth, if Jesus hadn't come back yet, then whoever, whoever takes this forward from there, is, that's what it's going to be about. It's always going to be about helping people become disciples, enjoying the very best life possible, and drawing other people to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this miraculous probabilities, we want to come to the place, we want to have a better understanding of the miraculous. And one of the ways to understand the miraculous is this. We have to understand how to see the unseen. We have to understand how to relate to the invisible world. You know, we have concepts of, of a spiritual world. And I tell you, when people talk about this spiritual world, honestly, you kind of, their eyes gloss over and roll back in their head. And, and it's like, they're, it's like a mystical concept, you know, and, uh, uh, we make it so mystical that we make it something that's out of our reach. We, we, make, it, we make it something we don't even know how to interact with. We make it something we don't even know how to get hold of. But the real truth is we want to be people who see and perceive and can interact in and function in the unseen world because the spiritual world isn't just a world, what we call a spiritual world, it's not just the world of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit and our interaction with 
things that we cannot see. You know, I'll tell you a scripture, and ah, man, this scripture has always, just, has always spoken to me. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, Paul, Paul is talking, he says in the seventh verse, I, I, I can remember as a, as a young pastor, facing a lot of persecution, by the way, reading this and getting a lot of help from this. He says, you know, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Don't you just love that? Man, oh man, oh man. You know what? This vessel may be weak, but this treasure on the inside, it, it, does never, it never diminishes in power. You know, I may get tired, but because I got this treasure inside of me, I can always exchange my strength with, with, with uh, Christ in me, with the power of God that's in me. So he says, he says uh, so we have this, this treasure, earth and vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. In other words, this is not about me trying harder. It's not about you trying harder. It's not about me being, you know, Mr. Disciplined, all kinds of, it's about me yielding to the power of God that is inside me by the Holy Spirit. But listen to this, he says, uh, he says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. I don't know if you're getting this, but it's like no matter what the negative situation is that's being thrown at him, he's saying, but this is how, we're, this is how I'm overcoming it. This, this, this is what's coming at me. This is what it looks like to be an overcomer in this kind of situation. And then he goes on and says, uh, he says, in verse 11, he says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that also that the life of Christ may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Let me tell you something. Every time you overcome, whether it's overcoming an emotional circumstance, a physical circumstance, a financial circumstance, a moral, ethical circumstance, a relational circumstance. Every time you overcome, you are manifesting the life of God. And people are seeing that and people are being touched by that. You know, the, the church, you know, the church has over the years has just embraced so much duplicity and hypocrisy because, I, you know, I can remember when I used to minister around some of these guys that were the biggest names in ministry in America. These guys would never admit that they fought battles. They, would, they wanted you to believe that they had attained to some level of, of spirituality and godliness where they, they just never, they never had a temptation, they never had a struggle, they, they never had a battle. Uh, uh, but the bad thing is that made the average guy out there who's struggling think, man, I must really be messed up because I have battles. Well, <clears throat> the greatest testimony in the world is not that you never have a battle. If you never have a battle, you're dead. You've already gone on to be with Jesus. You just don't, evidently don't realize it yet. But every time you have a battle and you yield to Christ in you, then you become an overcomer and you manifest the life of God, not only for your benefit, but for the benefit of the whole world, you know, to see and, and be drawn to God. So he says this, he says, uh, I'm going to scroll on down for the sake of time. He, said, he goes on to talk about verse 17. Now, now keep in mind, Paul had been beaten with rods a couple of times. He'd been whipped. He had been stoned to death. He had been in prison. He had to escape uh, for, for his life, you know, more than once from his own countrymen and from the Gentiles. He had, every, he had everybody in the known world seeking to kill him. He was in kind of the same situation Abraham was in. You know, whenever Abraham started walking with God, uh, the whole known world worshiped some other kind of God and wanted to kill him because they did not want the knowledge of God to be poured out in the earth. Well, that's the way it was with Paul. The Jews didn't want didn't want the world to have the knowledge of God. The Gentiles who worshiped other gods didn't want the world to have the knowledge of God. Uh, everybody was protecting their turf. So, man, he goes through all this stuff. I mean, can you imagine? This guy had to be beat up, scarred up, cut up. I mean, uh, uh, just imagine what, what he, you know, what he endures. But listen, verse 17, he says, For our light, for the, for our light, inflict, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding internal way of glory. Wait, wait a minute. Light affliction. Man, I'll never forget the first time I read that and realized, whoa, light affliction. This is from a guy that has been beaten numerous times uh, for preaching the gospel and still refused to give it up, still refused to, to, to close his mouth, kept preaching the gospel. This is a guy that's had to sneak all over the world 
and, and everywhere he went, he had to be smuggled in and smuggled out. And, and the minute people found out who he was, man, they set out to kill him because they did not want to hear what he had to say. And, and you know, he, he, he talks about being hunger, hungry. He talks about being without. He talks about all these things he went to, and it caused a, a lot of affliction. Well, why, why was it a lot of affliction? Well, you know, I'll tell you something. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of factors in this, but I want you to realize something. You experience emotionally whatever you focus your attention on. Now, stop and think about it. How many times have you been thinking about something negative, something sad, something destructive, and man, you're just feeling kind of depressed. You're just kind of, you, you know, you start feeling sad and despondent and, you, you know, you get to where you're like, I don't care if I live or die. It's just like, you know, I'm so, I'm so frustrated and, you know, wh whatever it is. And then maybe somebody that you really like and somebody that's a lot of fun calls you or comes in and says, hey, come on, let's go out and do something. In just a matter of seconds or minutes, suddenly you're in a great mood. Suddenly you're happy. Suddenly you're feeling good. How do you make that change so quickly? Well, it's real simple. Wherever you place your attention determines what emotions manifest in your, in your mind, in your, in your life experience. So what most people do when they're going through hardships, uh, uh, they, they focus all of their attention on those hardships. And even their prayer lives. It, it, you know, it, it, most of our prayer lives is, is, is a complaint list to God. And you know, we're whining to Him about what we're going through and, and, it, and it just keeps getting worse. It's like, God, you're not helping me. This just keeps getting worse. Well, sometimes, sometimes it's only getting worse in our experience because we keep thinking about it and we keep talking about it. You know, uh, it's about the most foolish thing in the world to pray the problem. You need to pray the solution because prayer is not where you go ask God to do for you what he's already done through the Lord Jesus. Prayer, the whole biblical concept of the primary concept of prayer is really binding and loosing. It is where we decide, we use the keys to the, to the kingdom of God and not the keys into the kingdom, but the keys that we use within the kingdom of God where if it has already been settled on the cross, we say, no, and we close that door. No, I don't allow you in my life. So what I do, I take my attention off of that after I've said no to it, and I put my attention on what has been given to me through my inheritance with Jesus, through the promises of God, and I begin to focus on that. I begin to acknowledge that. Well, first of all, just on a physiological level, not counting what happens on the, on the spiritual and the unseen level, just on the physiological level, suddenly my emotions change. Suddenly, I feel different. Suddenly, what I'm going through is not affecting me as much as it was affecting me moments before. Why? Because where I put my attention. Man, this is what the Bible talks about when, when it's talking about magnifying the Lord. Put your attention on God. Make God bigger. That's what the word magnify means. It means make something bigger. Make God bigger than your problem. Now, but Paul, Paul goes on and kind of explains this, uh, how he reaches this place where this is really just a lie of fiction. Verse 18, he says this. We look not on things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, we have deceived ourselves into placing our highest priority on managing and working with that which is seen. In other words, that which is temporary. And we attempt to define God. We attempt to define what's possible for us, what God can do in our lives based on our understanding of the natural world. And I understand we've got a physical body. I mean, I understand we are in this world, but we're not of this world. And, but the problem is we learn how to function as if we are of the world. You know, when we want to overcome a problem, what do we do? We, we, we default to the world system. We default to what we learned in school. We default to 
how our family did it. We, de we default to what, you know, whatever other corrupt way we, we have discovered that we can get what we want. And then, and, and, then, and then we do that, and sometimes we, sometimes we cloak that and under the name of Jesus. You know, we do something real corrupt in the name of Jesus. God bless this. Well, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're doing something that's in harmony with what God has said, you don't have to ask Him to bless it. It is blessed. You know, my wife used to always say this. You know, uh, uh, I don't even think the way that most Christians, I'm not against it, but I don't even think our approach to praying over our meals is all that scriptural. You know, the Bible really doesn't, uh, the Bible really tells us to give thanks when we eat. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know if this is correct, not correct, but, you know, interesting thing among Hebrew believers, they don't pray until after they eat because God says, after you're full, then you remember me. And it's like everybody's thankful for food when they're hungry. Everybody's thankful when they're about to eat it, but when they get full and satisfied, do they remember God? I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this, this is more in line with the Hebrew philosophy is be full and then thank God from that fullness and express that, that appreciation from God. But you know, you know, uh, uh, golly, I mean, we have, we, have, we have had thousands of people eat at our table. We've had thousands of people you know, spend time in our house. We've had thousands of people. Matter of fact, you know, when we had a when we had our other facility, we would often serve lunch for two hundred people at a time, two three hundred people at a time, and Brenda would oversee almost all of that. And uh, you know, she used to always say this. Now she wasn't against people being thankful and you know giving thanks, but many times would people would say, uh, "So, so our, uh, who's going to bless a meal?" And she's like, "You didn't ha you don't have to bless it." Uh, I touched it. I handle it. It is blessed. <laughs> and, uh, I used to always laugh at it. I thought, you know what? There's a lot more truth to that than people realize. You know, when we harmonize with God, the idea that we got to ask God to bless something that's, that is in harmony with what he has said to do and how he has said to do it, it's kind of ludicrous if you don't really know the truth uh, because it, it is blessed. Now, we sometimes take these carnal ways that we've learned how to do things and we think that we're spiritualizing them by asking God to bless it. You know, God bless me while I lie about this situation. God bless me while I commit adultery. Uh, God bless me while I steal from this person. Uh, you know, God bless me. And you know, and, I, and listen, if you've done those things, I'm not trying to condemn you, uh, I, you know, accept forgiveness for whatever you've done and move on, but just stop being foolish and stop thinking that you can get God to bless uh, that which can't be blessed. If it's not in harmony with the Word, if it's not in harmony with the truth, it cannot be blessed. It doesn't, doesn't. I mean, God can bless and protect you sometimes in the middle of your foolishness, but He can't, He can't, He can't bless, He can't bless murder. Uh, he can bless the murder. He can't bless adultery. He can uh, bless the, the adulterer, you know, he, he can't bless theft, but he can bless the thief. And, and, and you know, he can make us new people who, who have more morality and integrity and lift us up out, out of those situations. And, and it's amazing, you know, you know, how God can give us a great life when we make these, these foolish mistakes. But the point is this. Paul said, look, we exist. We conquer in these situations because we see the unseen. Now, the question is this. When you are faced with challenging situations, when you're faced with those things that are coming against you, destroying your life or trying to destroy your life, is your focus of attention on the seen or is it on the unseen? Is, is that which is unseen, that which, the life that you have in Christ, uh, the resurrection from the dead, uh, uh, the promises of God, the inheritance, these things that you can't even physically see are those things real enough to you that they, their influence on your life supersedes what you can see in this natural world around you? Well, one of the ways you move from something, you know, when, when you look at something in the natural world, the need is overwhelmingly greater than your resources, then it's impossible. You look at it and just say, this is an impossibility. There, 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 there is no way to solve this. But you know, sometimes we move from that place of impossibility 
to say, well, wait a minute, you know, with God, all things are possible. So, so okay, if God's involved, things become possible. Well, you know, something becoming possible just means, well, okay, it, that means it could happen. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean will, probably won't, matter of fact. It just means it could. Well, you know, I, I don't want to live just in the realm of things being possible. Jesus said all things are possible. Nothing wrong with that. But at the resurrection, things move from being possible to being prob probable. When we deal with these things in our heart, when we come to, to be fully persuaded of what we have in Jesus in our heart, they stop just being probable and they move to being absolute assurances. We are absolutely sure of what the outcome is going to be. Now, one of the things I'm going to be doing next week, I'm going to be talking to you very specifically about seeing the unseen, very specific about, about moving into that realm where your interaction is with, is with God and with the unseen in a way that is more real and more sure to you than anything you've ever seen. But the main thing is right now, you got to make up your mind. Do I want to go there? Do I want to stop having the, 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 what's going to, the probabilities of my life, do I, do, do I want to stop basing that on just what I can see, perceive in this natural world around me? Well, listen, let me tell you something. I got an incredible series about this called Miraculous Probabilities. And, you know, you can download it right now and start on it right this minute. And for those, you know, I'm going to have great messages that we're making available. And one of the things I try to, I always try to make sure that what we put out here to the world is not exactly like what we have in the series because I want to give you everything, everything that I can. And for those who want to go deeper, for those who say, you know what, I'm a disciple. I am moving my life in this direction. Uh, those are the people who say, I, I, I'm going to get this. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper. And so you can, you can go to, you can, if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever you are, you can go to drjimrichards.com and you can get this series right now and you can dive into this tonight and, and, and you can be ahead of the curve and then still pick up really important nuggets as we're moving through this series every week. So be, be sure and, and check that out with us. And also look around, go and look at our, our information about being a world changer with it because world changers, we're starting by Bible schools all over the world. We have our broadcast is in every nation in the entire world. We have books that are being read by millions of people. We have audio series that are being listened to by millions of people. And, and you might want to jump in here and help us do this because I'm telling you, we are going to reach and raise up a billion disciples around the world. If you enjoy this, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure and, and, and like it, comment about it, ask questions about it, share it with your friends. If you're not, if you're watching this on our website, go to our website and make comments and, and, and let people know the benefit that you're getting this, but be sure and share this with people that you know is going to help because, you know, this is a whole part of us taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. <music>